Now, John's clearly different. There's no doubt about that when we consider the four Gospels. John deals with concepts, with reasons, more than he does with storylines. There's no parables in John like there are in the other Gospels. There are selected miracles. Tony pointed out eight of them. And he selects those very particularly because of the theme that he has in mind. He has key words, as we saw also and we'll see again this evening. Now, the four faces of the cherubim are what those four Gospels are broadly about. Now, we should be careful you don't take some of this to drill down too deeply into the Gospel with them. But there's no question about the structure that is there in those four Gospels. The four faces of the cherubim, the lion, the ox, the man and the eagle. You'll find those four names in Ezekiel 1 and in Revelation 4. The cherubim, of course, appears in Genesis chapter 3, but we're not told of the detail of the cherubim. Probably they were angels on that occasion, but that's where the first mention of cherubim comes in. John is dealing with the spiritual element of the Son of God. Genealogies are there in Matthew and Luke with the natural lines descending to Mary and to Joseph. Mark doesn't have any as a servant. Slave had no genealogy. When you come to John, the genealogy is divine. It's the whole point of those verses we read this evening. In the beginning was the Word, and in verse 14, that Word became flesh. Now that's John's point. That's what he wants to get over to us through that whole Gospel, that God has had a purpose right from the beginning, that he focused that purpose on Jesus Christ 4,000 years into man's history, and he was the manifestation completely of the Spirit of God in a man in flesh. And that's what John is about, proving the divine origin of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He uses lots of different words. They're in the other Gospels, but as you can see from that listing, there are many of those words in John which are used many more times than they are in the other three Gospels combined. Now we've, in that second column, they are the combined usage of those words for the whole three. So you can see that John is really picking out very key words and placing them in his epistle. So you'll recognise many of those. We're not going to go through them now, but abide with me. We know that theme and he carries it over into his epistles as well. Because that's what God wants for each of us in the end. That in our hearts and in our minds there might abide the Spirit of the Son of God, the Word made flesh. And that we might believe those things and he stresses that all the way through. The Jews, um, it's not always the leadership, but most times through John when it says the Jews, it's talking about the leaders of the Jewish people and their opposition, of course, to Messiah. And so on through the rest of those words there. Cosmos at the end. Cosmos are three words for Greek, you know those. Cosmos is generally speaking about the order of things in, in the Jewish world as God established it. And John's very concentrated on that and we're going to see that a little bit uh, this evening. He... Uh, when we come to the time of writing, we're not going to spend time on any of this particularly. We're suggesting at the end that it was probably before AD 70. Most scholars today are agreed that it was either, it was earlier, certainly in the first century, before the Revelation was written, and most are agreed that it was probably before AD 70. Some suggest after. But it was certainly written after the other three Gospels. John 6.67 talks about the Twelve, but John doesn't even name the apostles and disciples in John. He picks out five or six of them in, the, in this first chapter we'll see next time. But he doesn't bother about the rest of them. He doesn't bother with their calling per se, just a few of them. There are many incidents and miracles, but not in John. Uh, in John, there's only eight miracles, particularly chosen, and six of those are in the other Gospels. So again, he's making a very particular difference in what he is selecting. Now, there's no reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. 
John 5, 2 says, there is at Jerusalem a pool of Bethesda. Now, if he was speaking and writing after AD 70, he probably would have said there was in Jerusalem. Why do I say that? Because you'll see, going through John's Gospel many times, he, he inserts commentary. He'll say something about an incident and he'll say a commentary about what happened afterwards. So it's not uncommon for John to put those commentaries into his gospel. If it was before, after the destruction of Jerusalem, one would think he would have been careful about that. So probably AD 65 thereabouts. There is, uh, again Tony pointed these out, there is these particular seven figures of speech which are not found generally in the other gospels the I am statements. They all make interesting studies in their own right. John again is saying, this is the one that has all of those qualities. Now, I want you to come over to John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. Right to the end of the book. This is really the key to John's theme. John 20... Tony said 21 is a prologue and the end of the book as far as his theses are concerned are these two verses here. John says many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. So he he tells us plainly what, what the things that we just looked at but there are many many things that he has not even bothered to address. But he says this is why I've written them. In verse 31, this is written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life, a theme of John, life through his name. That you might believe that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God. And he's going to keep on repeating that theme all the way through. And another interesting thing about John's record is it's really to do with the latter end of the Lord's life. You come to John chapter 6 and verse 4. Just skip over these points for the minute. 6 and verse 4, it says, The Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And when you go back through the record, that was the third Passover, the last one, before the Lord would be crucified 12 months later. So up to chapter 5 there, he's really done two and a half years of the Lord's ministry already, as far as he's concerned in terms of what his theme was. Chapter 7 and verse 2, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So that puts him six months on from that third Passover. In verse 6 it says, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. My time is not yet come. He knew there was only six months away to his crucifixion. And we're only in John chapter 7. John 12 and verse 1, basically just a bit over halfway, and we find the statement in verse 1, Jesus, six days before the Passover the Passover, the one of his crucifixion six days before. So John 12 through to 20 is dealing with the six days of the Lord's life and and in particular, in fact, the last few hours mainly in the latter chapters. So John and the Spirit are very selective about what they are presenting because he wants to show us, as we saw in John 20 there, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Come to verse 1 of chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In the beginning. We don't know when that was. It certainly was probably parallel to verse 1 of Genesis 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Whether that was sometime even more distant back, we, we can't be certain. But most certainly, in the beginning was the Word, was before the creation of Genesis chapter 1. 
how long before, it doesn't matter. But what John is telling us here is that God, his word, his purpose, his will, his actions, his thoughts, the very unity of his being was there from the beginning. He is steadfast. He is full of mercy and truth. There's no variableness nor shadow of turning, as James says. Right before our creation, he had a single concept and plan in his mind, which it calls here the Word. And that Word, really, he's going to say straight out in verse 14, became flesh in Jesus Christ. That was the plan of God right before the creation in which we are. All the things that have happened through those 4,000 years and on into our generation was mapped out by God, was there from the beginning. He has never deviated from that purpose and it's all summed up in that word, word. In the, that respect, that word, word, as we know, is the word logos, it's used 330 times in the New Testament. So it's not a unique word. It's about communication. That's what, that, what, that's what those 330 times are, communication. But it's clear in verse 1 and these following verses that it's, it's more than just communication. As Vine says, it's an expression of thought. It's concepts and ideas. And it's the sum of God's utterances. Brother Carter puts it this way. This word, word, in John 1 verse 1 is the thought of wisdom and power. But it's not just conceptually. It's in action. There's thought and expression. There's design and execution. You can't separate God's unity and purpose from what happens with his creation. And that's exactly the point John's making and is going to show us as we go through here. The dynamic of that is, of course, that 2,000 years ago, all of that found expression in Jesus Christ. In the Lord Jesus Christ, when he walked on this earth, we saw the living expression of the God of heaven. That's really what verse 14 is saying. So if we were to sum it up, sum it up uh, sort of conceptually there, the word is a concept and design in the mind of God, but it doesn't stop there. It finds expression and execution. And that's exactly uh, what happens. So you come to verse 1 here. In the beginning, beginning was the word. And I've just listed down there uh, what that's all about because it occurs 254 times, 45 times in the Old Testament. So it's not just in the New, but the word of Yahweh is 245 times in the Old Testament. Look, you have a look at Genesis 1. This is probably a very good example of that conceptual idea of the word. Here he is God creating the creation as we know it today upon the earth and each day each of those six days you have the repetition of this expression you have a look in verse uh, uh, eight, 8 and 9 say so verse 9 God said in verse 9 you come to the end of the verse and it was so now those expressions are there in every one of the creation days because there's your concept God said he spoke forth what was in his mind but had been there before the beginning of any of this creation and it was so so when God speaks it happens there's no sort of oh, well let's maybe consider all these options if God says this then it finds its outworking in what he is saying and let's look at Isaiah 55. We know that verse as well, but again it expresses exactly the same thought. Here's John 1 and verse 1. Verse 11 of Isaiah 55. So, says Isaiah, the prophet rising under inspiration, my word, 
shall be that goes forth out of my mouth. So here's his concepts coming forth as words from God's mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Now there's your connection once again between the thinking, the word that goes out and the execution that happens. And that is God. He is a unity. And when he says things, when he expresses things, they have come from that broad concept that he's always had from the beginning and they happen. If he visits the earth, things happen. So as you go on here, wisdom, Proverbs 8 speaks in similar terms. Hebrews 4 is another expression of it. The word of God is sharp and powerful and in his sight all things become manifest. There's the expression of the thought and then the outcome as well. And the ultimate outcome was our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's have a look now at verses 2 through to 13. Now, as uh, has been mentioned on previous occasions, these verses in 2 to 13 are like an, in brackets. They're in parenthesis. They, they add to the idea of what's happening here, but John is really saying in verse 1, and then verse 14. Now he's going to tell us in the intervening verses about the issues in respect to God's purpose, what it led to, how it focused on his son, how he got there through John. He's going to couple that in those verses 2 through to 13. But it's just building up to that point about the word made flesh. In verse 2 he repeats it to emphasise his parenthesis. The same was in the beginning with God. It's just really a repetition of verse 1. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, as Brother Tony said, and I, I totally agree, it's better if we read it in terms of verses 3 to 5. The translators, because they have a Trinitarian bias, have put him there. It doesn't greatly matter because you can still read that as God himself and that's, that's fine too. But it's really the subject is the word of God and it would be more appropriate. But certainly you could say God, but it's not Jesus Christ. Now that, that's your problem because of that Trinitarian bias. They think that Jesus is part of the Godhead and he was there with God and therefore in verse 3 all things were made by Jesus as well. But that's a misreading entirely of the thought of those verses because Jesus doesn't come into existence till verse 14. He was in the mind of God, most definitely there as the need for a saviour in the world and all sorts of other things. The need for that man was there and God knew that and understood that and it was part of his concept right from the beginning. But Jesus himself did not exist as a physical person until you come to verse 14 to Luke chapter 1 when the Holy Spirit formed in the womb of Mary our dear Lord and he was born into the earth. At that point he became a physical existence as a human being. He was only there previously conceptually in the mind of God. I, I emphasise that because I remember when I was coming into contact with our, our Christadelphian people. I was only a youngster then, but this was a, an issue for me. John 17 and verse 5, the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And that reads as though Jesus was there with God, enjoying the glory of God uh, prior to his existence upon the earth. But you see, John is merely expressing again the same idea of verse 1 and verse 14, that in the mind of God, Jesus was always there. He could say later, before Abraham was, I am. Not that he was physically there, but God had him in his mind and in his purpose right there from the beginning. So John is consistent in his language as you go through with those ideas. All things in verse 3, all things were made by him. Now that expression all things is clearly taken from Genesis 1 verses 8 to 10. God gave Adam and Eve dominion over 
all his creation. Now that theme of dominion over all things taken up in Psalm 8, expounded in Hebrews 2, it's taken up in 1 Corinthians 8 and it's finished up in 1 Corinthians 15 where God is all and in all and where it says all things shall be subject to him except God who made all things. And so that theme, John just grabs hold of that with those two words which take us back to Genesis 1 and right through, in fact, uh, many other passages of the scripture. God's intentions have never wavered. They've been there right from the beginning. In him was life, he says, and the life was the light of men. Life and light. God is the source of life and light. How is he that source? We have no idea. Life, eternal life and light, no one knows the source of those things except God is the source, as he says. If you come to Psalm 36, here's how the psalmist puts it. Psalm 36 and verse 9. Life can't exist without light. That's a scientific principle. There are some forms way down in the depths of the ocean, but as a general thing, life cannot exist without life. The psalm says in Psalm 36 and verse 9, For with thee is the fountain of life, eternal life. Life eternal is with God, and in thy light shall we see light. The two are linked together because God will give eternity to those who walk and continue in his light. And so that's what John is saying there in verse 4. In that word, which was God himself, was life. And that eternal life became the light of men. And verse 5 the light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, that's true, isn't it? Darkness cannot understand light. Uh, this hall was in darkness when we came, but not once the switch was turned. That's exactly the point John is saying here, that when you have light, darkness can't work with that. They are incompatible. It doesn't matter if it's a very flickering candle. The light of that candle will dispel the darkness of that room. This is not blind faith, brethren and sisters. It's faith based upon revelation. It is light. It is what God has told us about ourselves, about this world, about who he is, about who his qualities are, that he is the source of all good. So it's not a blind faith we're talking about here. In verse 5, when that light shines, it is a light of reason. It is a light that is able to be comprehended and the darkness can't comprehend it. If you don't take the mind of God as he expresses it and believe it as it is, John says, you will not comprehend what that light is. Here's some other translations of that verse because it does say, in fact, more than just that. Not just a matter of comprehension, but ESV and the net and Weymouth, it says that darkness has not overcome the light. Darkness has not mastered that light, says net. Weymouth says darkness has not overpowered that light. And that's really more the spirit of verse 5, that once the light of God shines forth, and once it is in your heart and your mind and you know it to be rationally true, darkness cannot overcome that light, unless we let it, but darkness cannot of itself overcome the light of the word of God. John makes that point, or Jesus does in John 19, let's go to that passage. He's speaking to Pilate here. 
In extreme circumstances, as we know, being rigorously interviewed by the high priest and the other leadership, is now before Pilate and the Pilate says to him in verse 10, aren't you speaking to me? Because he was as a lamb before his shearers is dumb. That was often and mostly his way through that process. He says, you're not speaking to me. Don't you know that I've got power to crucify you? I've got power to release you? Can darkness overcome light? Jesus said, thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above so the Jews have the greater sin and that's the whole point there the same point of verse 5 the darkness cannot overpower light the leadership of the Jews Pilate himself they thought they were in the control of those circumstances it was their hour as Jesus said but they were not in control of those circumstances darkness cannot overcome light and the Son of God was raised to life and he overcame the powers of darkness. And so that principle is there in verse 5. In verses 6 to 13, that theme of the light is basically what those next few verses are about. Light, understanding, knowledge, how was that conveyed and how was it implemented in the lives of people. If light is the way to life, then how did that happen? Well, verse 6, there was a man sent from John, from God rather, whose name was John. And he's going to develop that theme and we will uh, next week about the witness of John. See, there was no light for 400 years. Back to the times of Malachi and Nehemiah, as Brother Dave had with that 13th chapter of Nehemiah that was the last time that God had been revealed to his people 400 years before there'd been no light in terms of direct uh, in intervention by God in the affairs of the nation but now came this light John the Baptist a burning light one that spoke forth the words of God and he was sent to give witness to that light of course so in verse 6, there was a man sent from God, John says, whose name was John. Whose name was John. John means the grace of God. Zechariah, his father, the remembered of God. Elizabeth, his mother, God of the oath. And they are all ex important in terms of those names. Whose name was John. In the prophecy of Zechariah, Luke records, God had visited and redeemed his people. He performed the mercy or the grace promised, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. So here in verse 6, his name was John. And that was a significant point in, <coughs> in the life of Zechariah, Elizabeth and John, wasn't it? You remember the record. They came to, to, to Zacharias who'd been struck dumb because uh, another, again, a witness of what was about to happen. But he was not able to speak and they said, well, we'll baptise him or we'll call him rather uh, 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 Zacharias after the rest of the family name. But he called for a tablet and he wrote, his name is John. Here is the grace of God coming to this nation because God is going to visit his people. He's going to perform the mercy promised and the oath which he gave to our father Abraham. Many thought, of course, they meant the kingdom of God. But all those things were true in the visitation of Jesus Christ, though it not be at that time the kingdom of God. So we read in verse 7, the same came to bear witness of a light that all men through him might believe. The apostle John was going to expand the, not the Apostle John, sorry, Apostle John speaking about it, was going to expand the role of John the Baptist as a witness in the remainder of that chapter. He was a messenger to bear witness of that light which was to come. 
And that light in verse 9 was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And that true light, that's true that verse as well. It was a true light which cometh into the world and it does lighten every man. It's available to every man but not everyone will receive it. Not all are enlightened by the word of God. And again, you need to get to other translations because the part where it says that cometh into, he lightens every man that cometh into the world, it's not every man that cometh into the world that's being emphasised there, but the light that comes into the world, which is available to every man. And these translations make that plain. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So the light is available to everyone and that was coming now through the ministration of John as the forerunner of the Lord. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light was coming into the world and Weymouth says the same thing. So it's just a slight difference in emphasis there. John is not saying that every man is enlightened by the light of God's word. But the light of God's word is available there. It's come into the world for enlightenment available to all. So verse 10, speaking of light, he was in the world, the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Now we're coming now to a change in sense a little bit. It is the true light that was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. But that is in reality, isn't it, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not bringing him into it here particularly, but in verse 10, he is the true light. And verse 10 does describe exactly what his purpose was. That uh, he came into the world, the world was made because of him in the purpose and the construct of God in the beginning, but, just says John, the world knew him not. So, in those words there, we have the idea of enlightenment coming through the Lord Jesus Christ, but the world did not know him. Now, in verse 10, and back to the end of verse 9, that word world is that word cosmos, the one we, we mentioned earlier on about those three words of world we know, and cosmos is generally the order of things to do with the Jewish commonwealth. And so in verse 10, John is starting to focus on the Jewish nation, that that true light came to that nation. There was, that nation was put together because God had a purpose with them through Jesus Christ, but that world knew him not. But in verse 11, he came to his own and his own received him not. And that was very true of the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when he spoke forth the words of God, he came to his own people, but his own people received him not. Now that word received in verse 11 is a little bit different to the word in verse 12 as many as received him. It's the same in the English, but they're slightly different words in the Greek. And the idea is in verse 11 that they, he came to his own people and the Jewish nation rejected him. As a nation, as a whole, they did not receive him. But that wasn't the end of the story. In verse 12, there were many that did receive him in a personal sense, not nationally like the Jews, to those who did really receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God to them that believe in his name. The nation may not have responded, but individuals did, and eventually, of course, the Gentiles did even more so. In verse 12, he gave them power to become the sons of God that word power is translated also as right, authority, privilege. All of those words have slightly different ideas behind them, but 
They mean essentially the same thing, that by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world, he gave a privilege and a, an authority and a right and a power to those to become the sons of God. And how was that? Because they believed on his name. He was the salvation of Yahweh and they believed on his name. Weymouth puts it this way, which I think captures the difference in those two words. In verse 11, he came to the things that were his own and his own people gave him no welcome. But all who have received him, to them, that is those who trust in his name, is given the privilege, the power, the authority of becoming children of God. Then we come to verse 13. These sons of God, these children of God, in verse 13, are born, and of course he takes this up, chapter 3, about Nicodemus as well, but, uh, and we come to that later, but these are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man. And he's almost teasing this out, isn't he? In a sense, those three things mean much the same. It's not about flesh, but it's about God. These people were born and given authority and privilege. We are, brethren and sisters, as much the recipients of light because of God, not through the will of the flesh, as it were. So, Jesus Christ met those conditions, quite obviously. Here's what John is saying. Threefold denial of natural image. We're talking about the word of God, aren't we? <coughs> We're talking about the, <coughs> the concept of God himself and his concept and his power being manifest into people. And so there are <coughs> this threefold denial of flesh. It's nothing to do with blood, nothing to do with paternity. It doesn't matter who mum and dad are. It's not the will of the flesh. It's not about fleshly impulses to procreate or whatever. And it's not the will of man. It's not conscious human decisions to, to have children. It's nothing to do with anything to do with the flesh, but it is of God. And of course, Jesus Christ was just that person, wasn't he? He was born of the Holy Spirit by the Virgin Mary. <clears throat> so, for this cause, says Paul in Ephesians, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That's the point, isn't it? As brethren and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have believed on his name, we are now part of the whole family in heaven and earth that is named by the name of Yahweh as seen in his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we move on there and in verse 14, the climax and the point from verse 1, that word, all that God was, light, life, conceptually, expression, whatever you may think in terms of that word, it now became flesh. Not by the will of man, not of blood, not of the flesh, but of God. And God made Jesus Christ, made him in our nature. John is very careful to make that point. He's stressing the divine origins of Jesus Christ. That he was the word made flesh, but he was nevertheless made flesh. And these expressions, every one of them, are wonderful in the, in the way they are used here by John. He says, and. Just a little word there, but he's really saying, I'm going back to verse 1. There's the concept of God and that concept now became flesh. He was made flesh. The begetal of Jesus was unique, as we know from 
Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. He wasn't conceived in the same way as every one of us are, brethren and sisters. He was made, created in the womb of Mary to be the vehicle of God's majesty. And those words are picked up by Paul himself, Galatians 4. He was made of a woman, made under the law. Romans 1 verse 3, he was made the seed of David according to the flesh. And that's the whole point, isn't it, that it is of God, not the will of the flesh, but of God. And Jesus Christ was made uniquely and specially because he had to save the world. He had to do what none of us can do, live without sin, capable every day, every moment of making wrong choices like any one of us, but never making that choice, always fulfilling the spirit of his Father in heaven. And God had to make Jesus Christ in our flesh for that to be even a possibility came in identical nature to each one of us. He dwelt among us. And that's a special word there. It's not the word for dwelling or abiding like John uses very often throughout this epistle, uh, about this book and his epistles, but it's the word tabernacle. It actually means tabernacle. And when you come back to Exodus 25, of course, that's what what John is saying here, he was now the tabernacle of God amongst the Jews and amongst all of mankind. In him was going to dwell the glory of God. Again, that's why he, he grabs hold of that word. He tabernacled, he dwelt amongst us. And we beheld, he says, we beheld his glory. We saw, he's going to make great point about this right through his gospel we saw in action the character of God in all of God's will and in the kingdom of God of course as well Isaiah 40 the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together 2,000 years ago they saw the glory of God not physically but in the moral and the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says there that glory was the moral character of God himself. The qualities of Exodus 34, the name of God proclaimed before Moses, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, but by no means clearing the guilty. There is in the character of God that twofold aspect and it's seen in perfection in the Lord Jesus Christ. Full, as it says there in verse, in verse 14, full of grace and truth. He was the complete expression of God himself. Paul expands that thought in Hebrews 1 and verse 3, that, that fullness that was the character of God as it is seen in Jesus Christ. The image, very image, of the person of God himself. And grace and truth was what summed up the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they sum up the character of God. That's Exodus 34, isn't it? Twofold character. Romans 11 and verse 22. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. God and our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ showed forth those characteristics in their fullness and in their completeness in such a way as we can only strive to do ourselves. So, oops, gone a bit far there. We've now got three verses in 15 to 18 which are, are put here as an introduction into the rest of this chapter. No man, says John in verse 18, has seen God at any time the only begotten of the Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And he's really repeating the thoughts out of verse 14. No one's seen God, but we have seen him and we do see him in the, in the life and in the work uh, 
and in the expressions of the Son of God. In verse 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth wasn't given, it came by Jesus Christ. It was given by him too, but it came by Jesus Christ because it's never left him as it never leaves us. Moses gave the law and that was it. They had to go forth and do as God had told them to do. But Jesus Christ came and gave us, he came and gave us grace and truth and he is abiding with us as long as we abide with him in that same grace and truth that has remained forever, not like the law that was given for a particular purpose, but grace and truth came that it might forever remain there with the saints of God. And we'll pick up verse 19 onwards, the record of John, uh, in our next class. But I just want to leave you with the the same thoughts that Brother Tony left in verse 16. Of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. That fullness of the character of God in Jesus Christ has been given to each one of us. We manifest it very poorly as we all know. We don't measure up to that same extent but it is there for us. As the record says, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Weymouth, we have all received grace upon grace. And I really do love the words of the NET translation. We have all received from his fullness one gracious gift after another. And that sums up the spirit. John chapter 1. Uh, the structure is uh, fairly straightforward. We saw last class the word made flesh in the first 18 verses, how the, the mind and the purpose of God down through the Old Testament times finally became expressed in a person, in flesh, in Jesus Christ, in verse 14. Now John's going to turn in the rest of this chapter and prove that lineage of Jesus Christ, that he was the word made flesh. First of all, he's going to tell us about the leadership that came to him in those verses there, challenged him as to who he was, what his message was, and what he was doing there, and they depart, and he then outlines himself in verses 29 to 34, this is the one I have been given to show to you, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And then John leaves John the Baptist there, and in verses 35 to the end calls five disciples. He doesn't bother about the other seven. Uh, he may include James here, but certainly only five are mentioned because John's not really that interested in those particular ones except to establish once again his theme. He doesn't describe Jesus' baptism in any kind of detail. He doesn't describe John's message in any kind of detail. He doesn't even mention the temptation of Jesus. From verse 19 on that we're looking at here has happened after all of those events and John is reviewing them to convince us that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And he goes through those verses and all of those titles and positions of the Son of God come out of the record. All of those in those verses are repeated in those ways all the way through, right through to the end of the chapter. John's saying to us very simply in this chapter, here is the Son of the God of heaven, here is the mind, the purpose, all that God is about seen in a human being. 
and he gives all of these evidences here of those who are able to subscribe to that right in the early days. So we come to those verses 19 to uh, 28 verses in respect to the leadership. Now it's clearly the leadership in verse 19. This is the record of John. He says quite plainly, this is what I know happened. The Jews, the leadership of the people of Israel of that time, the religious leadership, sent priests and Levites to, from Jerusalem to ask John these questions. In verse 24, they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Clearly, the leadership was sent to ask those questions. But that was quite proper. It was the duty of leadership to test a prophet. Deuteronomy 16 says that. God appointed judges and officers, including the current leadership here in the line from Moses onwards, that would judge the people with just judgment. They didn't always do that, but that was the purpose God had with these leaders. In Deuteronomy 18, when a prophet, and here's one here, John the Baptist, speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the thing follow not and come to pass, then it's a thing which Yahweh hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumably, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So they were quite proper to come and say to John, what is your message? What are you about? Jeremiah 28 is an example of that happening. I won't go through that now, but there was a prophet there that prophesied of peace and Jeremiah was told if, it's, if it is the word of the prophet shall come to pass as Deuteronomy had said, then it be known that Yahweh hath truly sent him. But as that record goes on to show, he had not prophesied of peace at all. Now, it says there in verses uh, 20 to 23, uh, and Brother John, of course, uh, has made famous those verses because it's a reducing answer that John the Baptist gives, isn't it? They ask him uh, uh, in verse 20, and he denied, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. And then it gets shorter in verse 21. I am not Elijah. Are you that prophet? No. So he's contracting his answers all the time. He's not any of those things and they were proper questions from the leadership. He says in verse 23, I am the voice. I am the voice crying in the wilderness. And they said to him, are you Elijah? Why would they ask that? Well, there's two quotes, obviously, in Malachi and elsewhere. I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. So that was a proper question. Are you Elijah? Uh, Malachi said he would come before the coming of the day of the Lord. He said, no, I'm not. I hear that prophet. Deuteronomy 18 said, I'll raise up among the Jewish people a prophet from among their brethren. I'll put my words in his mouth. He'll speak them all that I shall command him. Are you that prophet? He says, no, I'm not. Now clearly those passages do refer to the Son of God and that's what John is going to prove to us and show to us in this chapter. That's a record that he's testifying to. He, he was not that prophet. This was his message in verse 23. This is all he says about it. doesn't go into great detail, but he says, make straight the way of the Yahweh, as said Isaiah. And again, we could go back to Luke and Matthew and the other records and deal with the whole message of Elijah, but that's not John's point. John's point is, this is the one I was sent to say, this is the Son of God. And that's all that he wants to put forward here in this first chapter in respect to his message and John the Baptist's message. Now, we, we just list that there because I think it's an excellent little summary of what John's message was. He spoke to all stratas of society and they were messages from Isaiah 40. You know those words in chapter 40 so well as mortal lies in Handel's Messiah and this was John's message. Every valley shall be exalted. The common people are going to be lifted up in the sight of God, of course, in the kingdom of God, but that's going to happen. Mountains and hills are going to be made low. That leadership which don't properly fulfil their function are going to be 
brought down level. The crooked will be made straight. Tax gatherers who were renowned for their extortionism and taking a bit and a bit more on the side, they will be made straight. And that, that passage is there in Luke and Matthew where each of these classes come before the Lord, before John the Baptist and have that message made plain to them. Even the soldiers exact no more than is due and don't complain about your wages. The rough places made plain, Luke chapter 3. So that was the message of John the Baptist. Make straight the way of Yahweh, as says the prophet Isaiah. So they ask him again in verse 25, well, why are you baptising then, if you be not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor that prophet, why are you baptising? Well, he tells them very plainly in verse 20, 27, 26 and 27, I baptise with water, you are all witnesses of that fact, but there's one standing among you, you don't know him. And we're going to find this in John's statements all the way through, right through the book really. He makes these little cryptic comments. You don't know him. And there is a depth of meaning to those words even at this point. They may or may not have known that Jesus, the one was he was referring to here, but in a spiritual sense, they did not know the one that John was preparing for. He says, I'm not even worthy to undo his sandals. These things were done in Bethbara beyond Jordan where John was baptising. And that's a great challenge, those words, to those leaderships, brethren and sisters, because they were left with only two choices. Deny that John was a prophet, and as other records said, they couldn't do that. They feared the people they knew he was. And so they couldn't deny what he was saying. The only other option was to say, well, his message must come from God. The one that he is testifying about must be the one that he is going to go forth and uh, preach the things which he has. You come to John chapter 5, verses 31 to 33. <clears throat> John, as does the other records, each one of them actually, makes reference to this very visitation to the fact that the leadership knew the message of John the Baptist. Chapter 5, verses 31 to 33. Jesus says to the leadership, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that bear witnesses of me. I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. You sent unto John. And they knew that, brethren and sisters. We just read about that. You have sent unto John the Baptist. He bear witness unto the truth. And he left it there with them, brethren and sisters. He didn't push it any harder than that. The other records he did somewhat. But that was the point. He was appealing to their conscience. They knew the work of John. They knew the words of John. Now they knew the power of John the Baptist's words to that generation. And he said, he witnessed of me and you sent a visitation to check that out. And he left that thought, of course, with them. As he does, brothers and sisters, judgment will come later and these things will be all brought clearly and plainly out. But the Lord is always interested in the conscience of the person. Now John's message went far and wide. John the Baptist's message was touched the whole and every strata of that society. If you come to Acts chapter 18, here's an example of how far the message of John the Baptist reached. It wasn't confined even to Israel. Acts 18, we have the record of Apollos in verse 24. A certain Jew in verse 24, named Apollos, born at Alexandria, that's, of course, in, in Egypt. Eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord 
And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And so that is evidence of the mighty impact that John the Baptist had in his message there on the banks of the Jordan River. And those Pharisees could not deny that. It reached right across here. Of course, Paulus was corrected in the way and he went on to become a very, very important influence in the first century ecclesia. But the point we're making out of that is that John the Baptist's message touched all stratas and went far and wide. And that leadership could not deny that John had witnessed to the Son of God. And he put that matter plainly in their path. Back to chapter 1 and verse 27. John says to them, this one that's coming is preferred before me. He is greater than me. I am but introducing him. I am the messenger of the covenant to bring this one to you. He says in all humility, despite the greatness of that message, his shoe latchet, I'm not worthy to unloose. A marvellous lesson in that, isn't there, brethren and sisters? Despite the greatness of John the Baptist and his message, he said, I am not even worthy to unloose the buckle of this person's sandal. Let alone, as we know, the lesson the Lord himself takes up later on. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Brethren and sisters, if John the Baptist was, didn't feel worthy to even undo his Lord's sandal, surely that lesson is very, very relevant for each one of us when our Lord himself was prepared to wash the feet of his own disciples. Despite that commanding authority, despite the enthusiasm and excitement with which he was received, the leadership was unable to discern the message of John the Baptist. Jesus takes a step further here in uh, verse 28 rather, uh, these things were done, it says there, in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptising. Now John's the only one, the only record that says Bethabara, all the others say Bethany, and most scholars are agreed that that's Bethany beyond Jordan. There were two Bethanies, one over near Jerusalem, which we read about in the other Gospels, and this one here where John baptised. It's thought that Jerome, if you're interested, Jerome perhaps uh, couldn't find Bethany and put in there Bethabara in one of his translations, one of his transliterations. But beside the point, Bethabara is not mentioned anywhere else. Bethany is clearly the place that is uh, meant to be mentioned there. So that's verse uh, 28. Then the leadership depart from John and in verses 29 to, to uh, 34 he says, this is my witness. The next day in verse 29, um, he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now he'd already baptised Jesus and he knew that Jesus was, as he says here, the Lamb of God. How does he know that? Verse 33, God had said to him, he bear record in verse 32, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven and like a dove and it abode upon Jesus, I didn't know him at that stage, that it was him, but he that sent me to baptise with water, the same said to me, upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending, remaining on him, the same is he which baptiseth with the Holy Spirit. And I saw, and I bear record, this is the Son of God. Very, very plain statement there, isn't it? God had given him that indication that when he saw that dove come down upon, in this case Jesus of course, that this was the chosen one. He was the Son of God. The dove would remain there because the Spirit of God would remain with Jesus Christ for the remainder of his life and into eternal life of course. But what a remarkable statement that is in verse 29. 
Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now that is the whole purpose of the Lord's first coming. He would remove sin. As surely as Adam and Eve had reduced it, he would remove it. And in this context here, not just for the Jews, John says, for the sin of the world. He's going to remove sin entirely. It won't have to be for any particular nation, it'll be for every person who wants to take hold of that message. This one is going to take away the curse of Adam and Eve. He's going to come as a conquering king, as a great warrior, as a lamb of God. Because that was to be God's method, wasn't it? We know that only too well. They had yet to learn that. But the way that sin and death was going to be removed was through gentle submission to the will of God. Honouring the will of God. Honouring the nature of God. Honouring the commandments of God. Completely leading and leaving aside the ways of the flesh. And like a gentle lamb, being obedient always to the commandments of his God. The Lamb of God. And that method would take away the sin of the whole world. You know, there's some interesting things about that. This is again from brother, thanks to brother John. There, under the law of Moses, all of the sin offerings were female lambs. There were male lambs in burnt offerings and other offerings, but never a sin offering. Never a sin offering was offered as a male lamb under the law of Moses, because that was not the means of salvation. Abraham said in prophecy, God himself will provide himself a lamb. The Passover lamb, when you look in Exodus 12, was a male without blemish, a burnt offering, but it was the Passover lamb, a male again, prefiguring the Lamb of God. And the Lord himself says in Revelation 13, he is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When Abed and Eve received those coverings of skins, there was the blood of the Lamb slain that they might receive the covering of God. What a remarkable statement that John made here in verse 29. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Adam and Eve introduced sin into the world. Jesus Christ, the Lamb provided by God, removed that sin by complete obedience, by living a sinless life, by his sacrifice upon the cross. Sure, he will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah when he returns a second time. But that was not the role for him and it's not the role for us. We are lambs that follow the Lamb of God, as we shall see, as John is careful to point out uh, in the record that follows. So in verse 30 we read, He is coming after me, which was preferred before me, and John adds, for he was before me. Either John the Baptist or John the Gospel writer, doesn't matter. He was before me. Again, he's hearkening back to those early verses. This one that is here has always been there in the mind of God. He has always been before me. He's, he's preferred in every way before me, but he was actually in reality in God's mind long before I'm standing here before you. They didn't know him as Messiah, John didn't know he was the Messiah until that dove came down and rested upon his shoulders. And that may seem a little strange because he didn't know Jesus. As he said to Jesus, I have need of being baptised with you, not the other way around. He didn't know of Jesus' character. There's no question of that. His mother, Elizabeth, Jesus' mother, Mary, they were cousins. So Jesus and John the Baptist were second cousins. They did know of each other. How intimately, we don't know, probably not greatly from the indications in the record. But he knew enough to know the impeccable character of this person before him. But he didn't know he was 
the Son of God, until that spirit-like dove came down upon him. And so in verse 34, I saw this, says John the Baptist, I am testifying to the record that God gave me and I testify that this is the Son of God. And as far as John's concerned, John the Apostle was a writer, that's the end of John the Baptist's record in, in his writing here. He doesn't particularly, except that passage he looked at, refer to John the Baptist again. In verse 35, the day after, John the Baptist stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And in effect, he said to those disciples, You go with him. My work is finished. He stood up as though he were to finish his work and he would depart the scene. And now Jesus, the Lamb of God, would take over those disciples and that work. Now I want you to notice in verse 33, again, John does this all the way, these lovely little words that he drops in. He says, the Spirit descended and remained on him. That remained, and verse 32, the word abode, are the same word, and they are that word that John uses often in his epistle and epistles, uh, is abiding place. This is my place that I want to come and abide with you. And the Spirit of God now abode upon him, and it abode upon him, as he says later in John, next chapter, he abode upon him without restraint. God gave him that spirit without measure. And here he was now, taking up his ministry, going to, in verse 35 to 51, call his disciples. But again, even in that record, he's calling these five disciples, but John's record is really the message behind the calling. It's not really about the five that are called. It's about what Jesus says to them, what they say in response, about the evidence that he gives in respect to his calling. We're going to pull that together uh, towards the, the end of our class tonight. But verse 40, one of the two, these are two that are first called, heard John speak. He was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, one of the two. Here's that little thing about John the Apostle, John the Gospel writer. He doesn't mention himself in this Gospel at all. And you only get these indications like verse 40, one of the two which heard John. And the other one was John himself. Later on, when uh, they're in the upper room, he, he motions to Peter to ask, who is the Lord talking about? But he doesn't say that he that did it, just the disciple whom Jesus loved. And statements along those lines. John, John very much steps into the background. He's really saying to us, not about me, it's about what I have seen, what I have heard, what I am witnessing to you all. In verse 37, these two disciples, John and Andrew, heard him speak and they followed Jesus. They followed Jesus. He just drops that in there like that. They were obviously prepared by John the Baptist and they were going to have further evidence given to them very shortly, but they followed the Lamb. And that's really that subtle challenge that John is dropping in there. They followed the Lamb. That Lamb is the Lord of all the earth. That Lamb is spoken of twice here in this first chapter, once in Acts and once in 1 Peter, and 29 times in the book of Revelation. The word lamb occurs, that's in the New Testament structure. A revelation, of course, was written by the Lord himself. They followed the lamb because Jesus was the lamb of God. And even in Revelation, where he has assumed all power upon the earth and over the earth and will establish the kingdom of God, he's still the lamb of God. Why does Jesus continue repeatedly, it might, by the way, Two or, two or three of those times are about the false lamb in there, so not, not every one of the 29 is Jesus himself, but the bulk of them are. Why does Jesus use that title in the book of Revelation? I would suggest because he's continually trying to reinforce with us that is the way to the kingdom of God. 
how did I come into this position? It was because God working in me with my obedience, with my submission like a lamb, as his lamb, was able to take away the sin of the world. And that's how adversarial positions, that's how strife and distress, that's how the issues of our flesh are overcome by submission to the will of God. And here is the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation, the King of all the earth, still saying, that's the message for the servants of God. You follow me, but that's the approach that is required for each one of us. We'll come to that one in a minute. In verse 38, he turns to these two and says, What seek ye? They knew what they saw. Jesus never speaks without intent. He knew exactly why they were coming. But he wanted them to think, What seek ye? He didn't say who. Clearly they were following him, but he didn't say, Who are you seeking? What are you seeking? And that's a very relevant for you and I today, any generation, any brother or sister of Christ. What are you seeking? What is your purpose in life? Why are you here? What are you really seeking after? You see, discipleship requires seeking. It's not passive. It's not something that just comes to us and we just kind of drift into the kingdom of God. We have to seek the kingdom of God. We have to seek that discipleship. It's a continual development of life and character. What seek you? said Jesus to Andrew and John. They, I think, are a bit like what Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration. They said, oh, oh, oh where, do you, where are you dwelling? Where are you, where are you living? Which has nothing to do with what seek ye, but uh, that was all they could think of. Well, show us where you are living. And again, Jesus goes beyond that point and says in verse 39, come and see. They're very cryptic words, aren't they? But they spent that time from the 10th hour, which is uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon Jewish time, right through that evening, and they spent that time with the Lord. We're not told what the conversation was, but it was clearly electric. It was clearly electric for those two disciples because they say in verse 41, we have found the Messiah, the Christ. He said to them, come and see. And such was his presence, such was his message, that they just were overwhelmed. We have found the Messiah. So in verse 41, Andrew rushes off and finds his brother Simon. They were partners with actually John and James. Uh, John was the other third one there. And that's why we say perhaps James that hardly would have left him out, but he's not here in the record. Those four were all partners in fishing partners around the Sea of Galilee. And so Simon naturally goes racing off, Andrew rather goes racing off and finds Simon. We have found the Christ and he brought him to Jesus in verse 42. And again, Jesus beheld him. John doesn't waste words, does he? Peter comes into their presence Jesus looks upon him, a bit like he did later on when Jesus had fallen those three times. It says, the Lord looked upon him. It was all that Peter needed at that time and it was much the same here. Here was Peter, but he says, you might be called Simon, but you are really going to be called Cephas or Peter by interpretation of stone. I have a great work for you, Peter. You're going to become the foundation stone of my ecclesia, Jew and Gentile, the foundation of my work and my sacrifice, but you're going to hold keys that will open that building and that mansion of God for Jew and Gentile. You're going to be a rock in the ecclesia of God. And the Acts of the Apostles is very clear, and Peter's epistle, that's, that's exactly what he was to become. 
But he didn't know that. At this point, he was a fisherman. And here's one that looks at him and makes these bold statements. Now, there must have been many, many other things said around that time. But Jesus had the presence, the authority to say the things that would convert these fishermen into disciples of the Lord. In verse 43, it says that the following day, Jesus would go forth to Galilee and finds Philip and says to him, follow me. Same statement, follow me, follow the Lamb. Philip in verse 44 was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew, and Peter. Bethsaida means a house of fish, as one would expect. They were all fishermen in that area. And Philip, in verse 45, he goes off. Again, we're not told what Jesus said to him. There must have been many things said at that time. But he was convinced, in verse 45, he says to Nathanael, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is the one written in the law and in the prophets. Now, Nathanael uh, means a uh, gift of God, and he certainly was that. And doubtless there was a conversation here between Philip and Nathanael. He was a student. He was a thinker. He says in verse 46, the common view of those times, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip says to him again, John drops these words in here, look, come and see. When you're in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you will see that he is truly as he claims to be. And that was a common view about Nazareth, of course, in those times, and the leaders of the Jews used it themselves in terms of de decrying the position of the Lord Jesus Christ, when they knew again, fully knew, that he was born in Bethlehem, in the line of David, exactly as Micah had said. They'd searched all of that out, they knew all those things, but they chose to use uh, this common misconception that Jesus had been born in Nazareth. But Nathaniel was a thinker, a student. He says there in verse 46, the things that he says about Nazareth, and in verse 48, Jesus says to him when he comes to him, I saw thee when thou wast under the fig tree. I saw thee when thou wast under a fig tree. Now that and the statement about him being an Israelite without guile convinced Nathaniel of what he had been told by Philip and the others about Jesus being the son of God. He knew, Jesus knew the character of Nathaniel, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Now clearly one connection there is of Jacob. Jacob was a deceitful person and Jacob stole his brother's birthright. Jacob tried to deceive his uncle Laban and came off worse. And through that process God was teaching Jacob not to be a Syrian, to get rid of that Syrian out of his life to become not Jacob the supplanter, but Israel, a prince with God. And that's what Jacob became when he came back into the land, when he learnt through his limping and other trials that he needed to put his trust upon God. Now Jesus, with his insight, was able to say in verse 47, Nathaniel, you're like the repented. Jacob, you are an Israelite in whom is no guile. Now Nathaniel didn't challenge that. He clearly must have been a spiritual person. If that wasn't the case, he clearly would have said so to his Lord, but he clearly was a spiritual person. And Jesus recognised that. By the way, it says Nathaniel through here. All the other gospel records talk about Bartholomew. And that's clearly, uh, clearly the same person. Bartholomew means the son of Ptolemy, if you like. It's a family name and uh, Nathaniel was his, uh, his given name, as it were. So Nathaniel, Bartholomew are the same people. Now there are several allusions here to the life of Jacob. That one there in verse 47, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. 
And there's also allusions to the prophet Micah. Again, I'm not going to, to uh, trace these three for you. If you're interested, by all means, take those passages down and, and have a look at them in detail in your own time. That expression in verse 47 is found in essence in Genesis 35 verse 10. After Jacob had come through all of the life's experiences of Laban, we had learnt not to be a supplanter, I had fought with the angel, and God said to him here, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel shall your name be. You have gotten over that aspect of deceit and guile. So there's that comparison that's clearly there. The angels of God descending and ascending in verse 41. The same picture is given of Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. And in chapter 1 and verse 48 it talks about Nathaniel under the fig tree. And in Micah 4 verse 4, a picture of the kingdom of course, but in that place it talks about every man dwelling under his own fig tree and none shall make him afraid. And here was Nathaniel in type in a sense under his fig tree thinking about spiritual things, thinking about whatever thoughts he may have had and Jesus knew that and said that to Nathaniel. That's where you were, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, you remember that Micah said in chapter 4 in verse 8, Jacob, the tower of Edah, well, that's where I became Israel. When I had gotten over all of those things and God said, I have gathered you to the tower of Edah in Micah 4, reflecting on Genesis chapter 35. Again, another connection there between Micah this time and Jacob and Nathaniel says in verse 49 you are the son of God you are the king of Israel and they seem to be plucked out of the air those terms we don't know the conversations that went on there but both those terms are embedded in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 if you wanted to go back and have a look at that the one who's going forth are of old, the Son of God, because his goings forth are gone right back to the beginning and before the beginning until he became the Word made flesh. And it says in Micah 5 and verse 2, you are the ruler in Israel. And that's the words, in fact, of Nathaniel there in verse 49. So there's some, some wonderful connections there between Nathaniel, Jacob, and the prophet Micah. And who knows if Nathaniel wasn't thinking about that prophecy under that fig tree. We don't know the conversation between him and the Lord. It's very, very abbreviated in this record. But it was enough. The presence and the message and the words of the Lord for Nathaniel to say, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. But Jesus then goes on to say in verse 51, at the end of verse 50, uh, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you have believed. You shall see greater things than these. They must have thought, what else? <laughs> He's told us what we're thinking. He's told us where we were. He's given us all these explanations. And now he says to us, I will show you greater things than these. And John finishes on this verse in verse 51. Reference undoubtedly back to the times of Jacob. But he says, look, those angels ascend and descend upon me. And they will do so through my entire life. And we can go through the gospel records and trace those times when the angels of God came to him particularly in his crucifixion in the garden, the, the angels came and comforted him. They restored him. They lifted up his spirit in preparation for that, that day to come. And the disciples were aware of that all the way through and they recorded it in those gospel records. And Jesus said, you're going to see that. And they're greater things because they're going to be ascending and descending upon the Son of of man. But John hasn't introduced that term before. This is the first time. He's the son of God. He's the king of Israel. He's the lamb of God. 
But you're going to see in my life in the next three years the work of God ascending and ascending upon me because I am not only the Son of God, I am the Son of Man. You're going to appreciate that I am the Word made flesh. I am the Lamb of God. I am the Son of God, but I am the Son of Man, whose purpose is to manifest the glory of God in a human being. And they would see those greater things at that point, and in fact, right through the Lord's ministry. They, they didn't understand that. We, we know that. They were utterly confused and confounded when he was crucified. But he says, you shall see greater things because you will see the work of God in the Son of Man. He's going to remove the sin of the world. He's going to vindicate his father because not only is he the King of Israel, he is the Lamb of God. And that's John's conclusion in this chapter because that's why he pulls this all together. He will be the king of the earth. He is the king of the earth. But he is that king because, first of all, he is the son of man. First of all, he is a just and merciful high priest. He is touched with the feelings of each one of us. And because he is the lamb of God and the son of man, greater things have been done through his wonderful work. So, brethren and sisters, in the beginning was the Word. Here's the lineage of Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. Not a natural lineage, it was a lineage through God. In the beginning was God's purpose in his mind, expressed only in his intention that it was God, it was all about God. It was totally in harmony with himself. And God worked through that purpose with light and life in those early verses. But his point was in verse 14, he was going to make that purpose into a human being, and Jesus the Christ. And he was to be the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel. But above all, for you and for I and for everyone that would take up his purpose as the Lamb of God, he would be the Son of Man. As the Father hath life in himself, he's given to the Son to have life in himself. That word's been expressed entirely in the Son of God and he's given him, that particular one, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. He understands you, he understands I, and he wants us personally to develop the qualities of that lamb so that we too might be in his kingdom when he comes back to this earth again. have these 11 verses to consider this evening from the second chapter of John, generally called the wedding in Cana. Uh, but really that is what it was about. But of course John is just using that incident as he says over there in verse 11, this is the beginning of miracles that Jesus did. And he picks out various points that happened at that wedding. And you're going to see I think that there's a lot, lot more under the surface to this particular miracle. You know, there hadn't been any miracles for 450 years. You think about it, go back, this is the first of them in Jesus' time. There was nothing to go right back to Daniel's time, down in the lion's den and those incidents. They are the last real recorded messages. The hand of God was there. Ezra and Nehemiah, as Brother Davis reminded us in his studies, the hand of God was there with them.
but they work by faith. The presence of God was surely there, but it wasn't visible as it is here for the first time for that 450 years. And it took place in Cana of Galilee. That's the area just north of Nazareth, about 12 or 13 kilometres or so north of where Jesus was born. And so the people to that marriage would have been people from that district and they were the disciples that were called, as we see there in, in verse 2, Jesus and his disciples were called and they probably had a relative connection. We won't go into the relatives that were there, but it does appear that there was a connection relative-wise to those guests. But all John says is that Jesus and his disciples were called into that area. Cana of Galilee. Remember the words of Isaiah chapter 9? He lightly afflicted Zebulun and the land of Naphtali beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations, which is exactly the area Jesus was brought up in and where this wedding was held. The people that were walking in darkness, as far as those down in Jerusalem are concerned, very great darkness, mixed with the Gentiles, all of those unclean things, but to them was revealed a great light. Upon them the light shined. And here is the beginning of miracles in Cana of Galilee. A great light was manifest, not in Jerusalem, the headquarters of the nation, but up there in that off-scouring, as they considered it, Galilee of the nations. And the basic point of this miracle was Jesus was going to introduce a new wine, a new covenant to that people. It was going to replace all the traditions of the Jews and that new wine would be that which would embrace both Jew and Gentile. And it began here in Cana of Galilee. Brethren and sisters, that's the basic message of that miracle. But it's just so wonderful how many things John weaves into the expressions and the words that he uses in this miracle that take us almost well beyond that basic meaning and fill out many more moral lessons for each of us. There were eight signs in John's Gospel. We haven't touched on this and we're not going to go into great detail in it. This is the first of them. He only records eight miracles. The uh, fourth one and the fifth one are in the other Gospels, but none of the others are. He selectively chooses those eight miracles. The first one was the beginning, where Christ manifested forth, as he says in verse 11, his glory, because he was to be the word made flesh amongst those people. And the last one, the catch of great fish in John 21, revealed the extent that that message would go forth. It would bring in a great catch of fish and the net would not break and none would be lost. And that was the message of John. We know he says in chapter 20, in those last words of his conclusion of his gospel before the 21st epilogue, he did many signs, Jesus did. Signs of miracles, he uses the word simeon, but these are written, he says, in verse 21, uh, 31, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That was the purpose of those eight miracles, to impress upon his readers that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And this is the first of those miracles. Such was the impact of those miracles, brethren and sisters, such was the impact of the life of Jesus Christ that the world was turned upside down. Jew and Gentile was brought into the gospel net. The course of history was totally changed. If you think about that, we're in 2023 from the birth of Christ. He has changed the course of history and he has made his mark upon the world. And John says these eight miracles are a demonstration that he is the Son of God. We're going to see many expressions that John drops in here. The first one there is in verse 1. 
The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The third day. What does he mean by the third day? When you go back into chapter 1, he's following the first week of the Lord's life. In verse 19, here's the first day. The Pharisees come to John the Baptist and ask him who he is. In verse 29, the next day, so that's number 2, verse 35 is the third day, the next day John stood with his disciples and in verse 43, the day following, the fourth day, Jesus would go forth to Galilee. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, the third day on from there, seven days. Why does, why does John point that out? Firstly, it's the first week of the Lord's life. From chapter 12, verse 1 to chapter 20 is the last week of the Lord's life. He's got that symmetry in his gospel. And these two, chap two or three chapters here are in that first week of his life. And from chapter 12 to 20 is the last week of his life. And he draws attention to that. He's going to concentrate on those key events. He doesn't tell us a lot in between. He's not interested in that. He wants to prove to us the sonship of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God. This miracle then was on the seventh day. The seventh day. And in God's plan of things, in that seventh day, there's going to be another wedding of the Son of God and his bride. And this first miracle gives the foundation of what that wedding is all about. It's the wine of the new covenant. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb finally come. We know about that marriage in the Old Testament and in the New. Here's two passages from Isaiah and Jeremiah speaking about God rejoicing as the bridegroom and the bride. And in the New Testament, we have Matthew 25. We know the parable of the, of the virgins. The bridegroom came and they were taken into the marriage with him. And Revelation 19 tells us very clearly about the marriage of the Lamb. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And on this occasion, Jesus and his disciples were called to that marriage. Don't say invited, we usually use the word invited, but that word called, as we know through the New Testament, has a deeper meaning than just an invitation. It is a calling to that which God wanted them to know about and to apply in their lives. It says in verse 2 there that Jesus was called and his disciples. At that point, if you go back into chapter 1, there were five disciples named. There was Andrew and John, Peter and Philip, and finally Nathaniel or Bartholomew. So there were those five named there, and James would undoubtedly have been amongst that group as well because he was the brother of John, the Gospel writer, and there's no way that John would not have explained all of that to John, to James, rather, his brother, when those things happened in chapter 1. So Jesus and his, at this stage, six disciples, others were to come later, came to this wedding. And there were, of course, six water pots. And those disciples, in a way, are represented in those six water pots, as we're going to see. You see, a marriage changes relationships, doesn't it? That's an obvious statement. When two people get married, all other families are now in the past and they begin a new family between the two of them, a new one, a new relationship, a new direction in life, new responsibilities, new challenges. John's disciples had to make that change. They were coming to the Lamb of God to become part of his bride. They didn't know all that detail then. But they were like those six water pots. They had to change into a new covenant, into a new responsibility, sever the old ways and go forward into the new. Come to John chapter 3 and verse uh, 
25. <clears throat> this very point is brought up to John himself. There arose a question between the some of John's disciples and the Jews, interestingly, about purifying the water in those pots, about those issues of tradition with the Jews. And what did John say in verse 28? I am not the Christ. You know that I've said that before. I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, which he was, stands and hears him and rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. He makes it quite plain that Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. His disciples had to transfer to him, had to change their relationship and become his bride because he was the one who he testified of I am not the Christ, but this one is. So they had come and been called to that wedding. And the seventh day of the week came, and the seventh millennium will come then. Very soon, we pray, as we come into these last times of the Gentiles. We read in verse 3, when they wanted wine, this is back in chapter 2, when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto them, they have no wine. <clears throat> this was a disaster. They have no wine. Wine you know of course, and we won't go into this great detail here, but wine is a symbol of gladness and joy, of divine teaching, of prosperity. And in this case with the wedding, of course, it was a symbol of gladness and joy and prosperity of that time, such as it was. But we're going to see, of course, that it's a symbol of the new covenant, which the Lord told us about in his Matthew 26 to the bread and the wine in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This, this wine is a symbol of the new covenant. It's also used in a negative sense of the false teachings of Babylon, of Rome, of the churches, and also in Revelation of the wrath of God, drink of the winepress of the wrath of God. So wine's got a, a whole variety of symbols. Of course, in a wedding, in its natural setting, it was a symbol and a recognition of gladness and joy. But here it's going to be a symbol of that fourth one, the new covenant. But this was a, a disaster. You notice here that John doesn't say they are running out of wine. Mary doesn't come to Jesus and say, look, they're nearly out of the wine. He says very clearly that they have no wine. And that was a disaster. And they had replaced, in symbol, Israel at that time, had replaced the gladness and the joy, the divine teaching that was God, the prosperity that came with it. They had replaced that with their own traditions washing of cups and so forth and those sorts of things. And so Mark says in, in chapter 7 and verses 5 to 9, the Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus and they say, Why walk not your disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but, but eat bread with unwashing hands? And he answered and said unto them, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And notice the last couple of verses. They lay aside the commandments of God and you hold the tradition of men such as we see in this miracle, the washing of pots and cups. He said unto them, For well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. They have no wine. And that is what exactly what Jesus tells them later. That was exactly the condition of the nation at that point of time. They hadn't run out of mine, wine, they just had none. They had totally replaced the commandments of God, the Spirit of God, engraven on their hearts. It wasn't. It was engraven upon stone like those water pots and they had no wine but water in those pots. The traditions 
that they had adopted of their own ways. Now, brethren and sisters, we are in exactly the opposite position. Every Sunday we are able to take of that wine. It never runs out. The Son of God is sitting upon the right hand of God and his mercy and grace is forever there. There is no time ever that he or us will run out of the wine of that new covenant. And that's what Jesus is going to say to us in this parable here, in this miracle here. As we saw in verse uh, 10 there, you have kept the good wine till now. And it was never going to run out once Jesus Christ had revealed the terms of that new covenant. Jesus says to his mother in verse 4, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now he was not being rude, he was not being impolite. That would not have been in any way the character of the Lord. When he used the word woman, that's not uncommon in the scriptures if you like to look that one up. We won't go to it, but John chapter 19 verse 26 when our Lord is there upon the cross. He uses exactly the same term again. Woman, behold thy son. So it's not a term of impoliteness or rudeness. But why doesn't he say mother? Because that's who she was. Why does he adopt this more formal tone? Because Mary too had to learn that same lesson as those six disciples. The core issue of this miracle my hour is not yet come. My crucifixion is still, is still in the future and we are about to begin, in effect, years of ministry that will lead to that event. Why did Jesus bring that up in that way to his mother at this point? Because Mary had to realise, though she was his mother without question, he was truly to be about his father's business. This first miracle signified the beginning of his ministry, the beginning of the ministration of that new wine, a new way of life, a new way of thinking that would overthrow all the connections of family, of religion, of culture. They had to embrace that new wine. Family ties were secondary. His father's business, his father's will, had to be the first priority. You notice John is careful there in verses 2 and 3 to say the mother of Jesus was there. Doesn't say Mary, doesn't work upon that relationship as his mother, but he says she is the mother of Jesus. That relationship had now to change. It couldn't change physically, of course, it was a reality. But it had to change as a relationship. The Son of God was commencing his work. There's no mention of Joseph. Clearly, Joseph had died. Mary was a widow at this point. We don't know at what time that happened. Be no question whatever that Mary, at least after Joseph had died and probably before, relied heavily upon Jesus himself in household matters. He was the oldest son. He had a maturity beyond his years and a spirituality that was undoubted and so did Mary. And there's no question that she would have relied upon him time and time again. But Jesus is saying kindly to her now and those disciples, you have to renew a different relationship now. I'm about to commence my father's work. Did uh, Mary take umbrage that the way Jesus spoke to him, to her, Verse 5, she says to the servants, whatsoever he says, do it. There's no sense of uh, having been rebuked there in those words, whatever. She didn't understand, I don't think, what he was saying necessarily, but she knew enough about him and what had happened to that point to say, whatever he says, you do it. She was chosen to bring the Son of God into the world. She was a wise and a spiritual person. Luke tells us she pondered these things in her heart. She didn't understand them fully at all. 
but she knew that he was Jesus, the Saviour, the Son of God. There was no question about that. She knew that for, because of what had happened to herself, but she didn't fully understand it. She accepted what he was saying. Verse 6, it says, There were six water pots of stone. Six is the number of man, the number of flesh. There's no need to go into that detail. But what John is particularly doing here is talking about the, um, the aspect of the uh, water pots of stone being the purification rites of the Jews. And we saw that here in Mark chapter 7. And uh, those were the words we looked at before when um, uh, Jesus was speaking with the Pharisees. They, they were concerned with the washing of pots and of, cot, uh, and of cups. And that's what those six water pots were all about. They were water pots of stone. That word's only used three times in the New Testament. One of those other times is 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 3. And it's speaking about the law of Moses, which was in tables of stone. And that also ties in with these six water pots. They held the water for purification. They were a symbol of the old way, the law that was about to be taken out of the way and the new covenant that would be manifested in the hearts and minds of individuals. There were six, as we saw, six... Uh, disciples present there. Five mentioned in chapter 1 plus James. They had to take on a new relationship. It's very interesting when you come over to Acts chapter 10. Again, we won't turn this up and trace through it, but in Acts chapter 10, Peter, when he was conversing Cornelius and when he was reporting about that conversion, he took with him six brethren. You know what he saw, of course, in Acts 10. What God has cleansed, call thou not common. So it's a parallel situation. The cleansing ways of the Jews and their traditions were going out and the new covenant was now to be introduced. And here it is by Peter, who held the keys of the kingdom, he was going to introduce that new wine to the Gentiles. And Acts 11 says he took six brethren with him as witnesses. But interesting that there should be six as well. And in Acts 15, Peter says in his summary, God which knows the heart bore them witness, gave them the Holy Spirit as he did to us, and he put no difference between us and them, purifying, what, with the water? No, purifying their hearts by faith. They too now, the Gentiles, were adopting the new covenant. He'd learnt from that miracle, he'd learnt from the life of the Lord, and now he was conveying that to Cornelius, that faith is what purifies the heart. The principles of the new covenant are what are purifying to each one of us. The uh, verse 6 says that these six water pots of stone for purifying, they'd washed their hands, their feet, so on when they came in, they contained two or three firkins apiece. Again, you say, why well, does John tell us that's the size of those pots? Well, it's just interesting, again, if you uh, have a look at this through your Bible dictionaries and Google and so on. A firkin is uh, said to be, it's an old measure, and when we convert it from gallons to litres, a firkin is about 41 litres. So these are quite big pots. You, you see them around the place from time to time, and there were six of them. It says there are two to three firkins apiece, so they're odd sizes, but they had about two to three. If we take 2.5, which is midway between the two and three, that means for one pot, 102 litres, getting to be quite a bit of wine, isn't it? If you convert that six water pots, you've then got 615 litres. If you take a bottle of wine today at 750 millimetres, uh, millilitres rather, that's 820 bottles, 820 bottles is about 68 boxes. Why, why bother with all that? I'm a accountant. But apart from that, 68 boxes. That's a huge amount of wine. They were not going to run out, were they? Not now. They had no wine, but under Jesus Christ, they would not run out. 
There was ample wine there. And not only so, verse 7, Jesus says, fill them to the brim. Fill them right up. I want you to have a full measure of this new covenant which I'm going to give. Here's what the apostles and others say about that. Fill them to the brim. I came, says John chapter 10, that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. Filled to the brim. Ephesians 3. Unto him that is to able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Filled to the brim. In 2 Peter 1. So an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, fill those pots to the brim. My true disciples, those who overcome the flesh, those who are married to me as my bride, will have more abundantly in this life and in that which is to come of the things that really matter, the issues of the new covenant. And then he says in verse 8, draw out to the ruler of the feast. He says in verse 8, draw out now and bear it to the governor of the feast. Again, John just grabs a couple of words, draw out now. Of course, what what else could they do but dip the beaker into those water pots and take it to the governor of the feast as the wine. But John says, draw out that wine. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. With joy... You will draw water out of the wells of salvation. And that's just what they were doing here, drawing out to the governor of the feast. John himself in chapter 7, reflecting on the words of Jesus, says in verse 37 and 38, this was at the Feast of Tabernacles towards the end of that feast, he said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. There will be an abundance, and there is an abundance, of the life of the new covenant in those water pots which Jesus had supplied. In verse (coughs) 9, the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and he knew not whence it was. And then he got this little statement in there. But the servants which drew the water knew the governor called the bridegroom. The servants that drew the water knew. Just, of course they they did, but why does John slip that in there? Because we are God's servants. We are the ones that know. We know the value of that new wine, that new covenant. We know the source of those things. We appreciate what God has done for us and we draw out with wonder and value those things that God has given to us. May we be like those servants in verse 9 and who know and appreciate and draw out what God has provided in that new covenant. Of course, the MC in verse 10, he says, Look, bridegroom, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when people have well drunk, they're not quite sure what's happening around them perhaps, then that which is worse. But you've kept the good wine till now. It's a fairly obvious statement. But the wine must have been noticeably superior for the MC to make a comment like that. Noticeably superior. When in reality, as he said, most people would leave the more inferior wine to this point in time. And that's so with the wine of the new covenant. It's superior in every way. And it has been left, it has been left, as it says, until now. Because now the Son of God 
was to be manifest amongst them. Now the wine of the new covenant was to be released not just to Jews but to all the Gentiles and God had left in his wisdom in his six and seven thousand year plan he had left that good wine until this point in time. See God does things in reverse to us doesn't he? God does things the other way round to mankind. God does things the best way. Mankind would do it, as the MC says there in verse 10, mankind would do it the other way round. But God knows the cross must come before the crown. And he kept the new wine till now so that his purpose could be unfolded and now Jesus Christ would be revealed. This first beginning of miracles, he would be revealed to the world. And the new wine would be left until now and it would come at the end. Yahweh has spoken it in Isaiah 25. At the end there will be a feast of wines, wines on the leaves, well refined. He will destroy the covering cast over all people. And in verse 8, he will swallow up death in victory. He will wipe away tears from off all faces and the kingdom of God will come and it will be, as it were, a feast of wines well refined. The best wine left until now and that wine was about to be revealed in the presence of the Son of God. Verse 11 this beginning of miracles did Jesus when he manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. When he manifested his glory. It sounds a bit strange in a way, doesn't it? But that's exactly what, what he's trying to say here. It was the glory of the Son of God. Chapter 1 and verse 14 we beheld that glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And brethren and sisters, that glory was now to be manifest to all of Israel. His, his glory. And that relationship had now changed with his disciples, with his mother. But they had to recognise the beginning of that change of that relationship in this wedding that they were coming to in Cana of Galilee. A covenant written in the heart of his followers. A covenant sealed with the bridegroom's crucifixion and resurrection. A new wine kept by God so that men might know and appreciate his grace towards them. May each of us drink anew with him that new wine in the kingdom of God. Last class we looked at the early part of John chapter 2 where the Lord at the marriage in Cana performed the miracle of changing that water into wine in those six water pots. And that was his first miracle recorded of him both in time and as John points out it was the beginning of those signs, those eight signs that are in that gospel. Now we come in verse 12 we're about a few months later, actually, because you read about verse 13, it's the Jews' Passover. So that was his first Passover that he attended in his ministry. There would be another two, and then the fourth one would be the final one, of course, when he himself, as the Lamb of God, would be that Passover. So we're three years to go before that event. But John is very particular in choosing this incident. There were many other things that had happened before this, things which he doesn't worry to record about Jesus' baptism, Jesus' temptation, Jesus' beginning of miracles in terms of his ministrations, apart from that first one there. 
but he, he steps straight across to this next incident, which was really, in a sense, his public showing to the leadership in Jerusalem. Now, he had seen them before. They'd come down to John's baptisms, and John had pointed out to them that he was going to show them the Messiah, in effect, the Lamb of God. So they weren't unfamiliar with him at all, but he's now going to confront them very publicly at the beginning of this first Passover that he attended. We read there in verse 12 that he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brethren, all of those that had been to that wedding in Cana and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Now, that place in Capernaum was in reality his headquarters, the, the starting point and the, the home office, the home start point where he came back to many times throughout the ministry. We've got just two quotations there and there are others, but it talks about Capernaum as his own city. You can see it there on the map. It's up there in Galilee, not a huge distance from Nazareth. He'd have been very, very familiar with the geography of that territory. And he stayed a lot of the time in his ministry up there because in many respects he would not be harassed by the authorities down there in Jerusalem because his hour had not yet come. And that could have come at any time if he had chosen to, to take those matters uh, before his father had dictated them to be. So that's why he was actually more centred up there in the area of Galilee. And, and the quote in, quote in Mark 9, he came to Capernaum and being in the house. So once again, that seems to pretty well indicate that he had a house there of some sort, not his probably, maybe it was Peter's, as he healed Peter's mother. We don't know the details, but there was a location there in Capernaum uh, where he came to between all of his ministrations. So we come to the next point in verse 13. The Jews' Passover, uh, I should say rather with verse 12, his mother, his brethren, left him at some point here because they didn't understand the message of those pots they're not ready to receive the new wine and neither really were his disciples although they stayed with him and of course learnt through that process. But his brethren and his mother went back to Nazareth and in the record shows over those next three years they came on occasions and said look, look, look he's beside himself we need to get him out of this circumstance. They did not understand that he was about his father's business and that his hour would come and these three years were the preparation for that time. However, verse 13. The Jews' Passover was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Notice what John says. He's very, John is exceedingly careful with the, the words and the phrases that he uses. He says in that verse, the Jews' Passover... Why does he call it the Jews' Passover? And as we know in John, that's an expression he uses some 68 times. The Jews, the, the leadership, not, not every 68 are the leadership, but the majority are. It's an expression of saying, here is the leadership of this people. This was their Passover. It was their Passover. Why? Because they had in fact corrupted what was Yahweh's Passover. It's very clear, we won't turn those passages up, but Exodus 12, which is the foundation chapter for the record of the Passover when Israel came out of Egypt, and the instructions are given there in chapter 12 for the eating of that first Passover. But God is very clear in that chapter. In verse 11, in verse 27, it is his Passover it wasn't the Jews' Passover. It was Yahweh's Passover. And when he came to embody those three major feasts in the law of Moses itself, Leviticus 23 is a very excellent chapter. If you're wanting to put a, a note about where these feasts were, that chapter gives you the whole three of them in a nutshell 
in that one chapter. And once again, the Passover is called Yahweh's Passover. See, John's saying right here at the outset, they had corrupted God's Passover. This was no longer what God intended, a celebration from the darkness of Egypt, a celebration of their release and an entry into the promised land. They had converted all of that to their own traditions and their own ways and they have done that right up until today. It is a Jew's Passover, it was not Yahweh's Passover. In verse 14, he made, uh, it says there, he, he found, he came to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, changes of money sitting. Now the law allowed that to happen. The law was quite specific in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Again, we'll just use the slide for this passage. It allowed them to uh, not bring animals to the sacrifice, particularly if they came from far country. They could come to that place and buy those sacrifices. That provision God graciously allowed in Deuteronomy 14 in those verses we've got there. If the way be too long for thee, you're not able to, to carry your offering, or if the place be too far from thee, which Yahweh shall choose to set his name there. Of course, we're reading Deuteronomy and they weren't in the land at this stage, but that's Jerusalem, of course, where God set his name. And he's saying, look, that's the place that I'm going to choose. That's where I want these offerings to be made. That's where I want the Passover to be kept. But I understand that even in the land itself, you may have to travel for days to get to that place. And I am making provision for that. You can, in verse, uh, the, the, the latter part here, you can bestow money for whatsoever your soul desires. Oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, whatsoever your soul desires. You shall eat therefore before Yahweh your God. You shall rejoice thou and thy household. And you can see the uh, spirit of that expressions there. God was allowing them to not have to take those animals with them so that in that last verse there they would be able to rejoice before their God and not be worried about all the mundane things of, of getting their animals and offerings to that city. So God made a very generous provision that they would be able to buy their sacrifices once they got to the city of Jerusalem. But when Jesus came, he found those that sold oxen, sheep and doves and changes of money sitting. Once again, they'd taken that generous provision and they had corrupted what God had laid down. This place was called the, the Shambles of Annas. I don't think it was quite because it was a shambles, although it would have been something like that. But that is an old English word which has to do with poultry and, and animals and other things uh, being slaughtered. So it was probably that name originally, but it certainly was, in our terms today, a shambles. It was a marketplace controlled by the high priest and the leadership, the Jews, and they extracted gain from the changeover of these animals for offerings. This is a model of the city of Jerusalem. Many of you may have seen that uh, over there in Jerusalem. And that's the part that has to do with the Herod's temple. That's just a, a uh, model of it. But it was something along those lines. The building in the centre there is the sanctuary. That part there. That was the holy place and the most holy place. Coming out from there was the court of the women and around the outside here was known as the court of the Gentiles. They had a sheep pool over here for the washing the animals and so on and the Romans erected this fortress so that they could keep an eye on these uh, rebellious and revolting Jewish people. And so uh, that became a feature in Paul's time and other times as well. And they controlled very much what happened there. They allowed the Jews freedom of worship. 
but they did restrict them in many ways. Um, one of the things they restricted was their use of their own coinage. They would not allow them to change that coinage. They said, you will use the coinage that is available. They could not mint their own coinage. And so this was what was used in the top half of the slide there, what's known as the Tyrian shekel. And the Jews, of course, chose that because it had the highest silver content of any coin in the empire. It had on its face a pagan god and an eagle. Now they wouldn't allow, that's the one the Jews used, they wouldn't allow any of the Roman currency because they all had the head of Caesar and they were right about all of that. But they were prepared to use this coin here. It had a pagan god on it. Well, they just stretched that a little bit. But the main thing was for them, it had the highest content of silver of any coin in the Roman Empire. But they, they were very, very constricted by that, very, very unhappy about that. And it was one of the things in AD 67 just trivia stuff. They went and minted their own coin. They'd had enough of the Romans, had enough of all those restrictions. And one of the crazy things they did in the middle of all of that strife and rebellion was say, right, we'll mint our own coins. And uh, those coins were minted around about uh, AD 67. But uh, can you see the Jews here were doing this to extract the maximum profit from that provision of Deuteronomy that we read earlier. Maximum profit from the exchange of the money into the Tyrian shekel, from the exchange of that money again to buy the offerings and the sacrifices needed for the Passover. And Jesus found in the temple that situation. Again, as I said to you before, John just drops these words into the record. He found in the temple. What a wonderful expression that is, brethren and sisters. What would he find in our temple? The temple of the living God of which each one of us is. As he went into this literal temple of these Jews, on the Jews' Passover, he found corruption, he found extortion, he found all the things that were hateful to his father. We remember about the Passover in Exodus 12 again, seven days you eat unleavened bread. Ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. And they had to go through that house and search for that leaven and cast it out. He found in the temple all of that leaven. John is very particular in the expressions that he uses. What would he find in our lives, brethren and sisters? Take it away from the literal events of this situation here. Were the Lord to come today, what would he find in what should be the temple of the living God in each of our lives? Well, in verse 15, he made a scourge of small cords. He drove them out of the temple and he poured over their, change, their money changers tables and overthrew them and cast them out and the sheep and the oxen and he poured, over, poured out all their money from their tables. He was fulfilling Malachi chapter 3. These were not uncontrolled rage, brethren and sisters. This was very deliberate action on the part of the Lord. Let's come to Malachi 3. We'll turn this passage up. So I think it's worth just contemplating for a few moments. He never ever lost control. As we'll see, even with the whip that he used, he was in complete control in this whole process. He was fulfilling the words of Malachi 3. I will send my messenger... John the Baptist, he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant. He shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? 
He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. The Jews' Passover. He will purify the sons of Levi. He will purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to Yahweh, not what they were doing then, but an offering in righteousness. Now that purification is not going to happen until the Lord comes again in its final form. But here was a taste of what the Lord is going to do in the future. It was a controlled action. He was fulfilling those words in Malachi chapter 3. He came suddenly to his temple and he found there things that needed purging. And that's exactly what he did. It says in verse 15, he took a scourge of small cords. Scourge just means a whip. Small cords, a lash of rushes or flax, a bit like those brooms you see in some places, people sweeping streets with the flax brooms. They were just cords like that, flax pieces like that, which he just wound together and he used that to drive them hence. I mean, even if you got hit with it, it would hardly be a sting. So it's not as though he was attempting to do anything physical in that, in that action. It was a controlled action to say, this should not be. This is my father's house and you have polluted it. In verse 14, the changes of money, that's actually a, a different word to the earlier, earlier verse there uh, in um, <clears throat> Verse 15, it talks about the changes of money that he overthrew the tables in verse 15, changes of money in verse 14. They're two different words. In verse 15, he particularly tipped those tables over where all their prophets were sitting. These were small coins in verse 15 that were sitting upon that table. They were the prophets they were making out of this exchange and he overturned that and, and threw out the piles of their ill-gotten gains. Would have been chaotic, wouldn't it? Sheep bleating, oxen tearing here, there. But you see, he was still in control. In verse 16, he said to those that sold doves, Brother Jamin made this point a few weeks ago, he said, take these things hence. He didn't unlock the doors. He didn't suddenly have doves flying all around the place because they would have been very hard, of course, to recapture. So he wasn't trying to destroy what they had. So he said, take these hence. Sheep and oxen, they could have regathered those, okay, but doves would have been much harder. So as I'm saying, he was very much in control. Take them hence. You know, Brother Jamin again made this point, and let's see it over in Romans chapter 15. You see, verse 17, before we go to Romans, the disciples remember that it was written in Psalm 69, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And they saw that before their eyes. But as Brother Jamin pointed out, the record, he stops, John stops at that point. He doesn't continue with the rest. He leaves us to take that point up. And it's over there in Romans 15 in verses 1 to 3. And it has to do with the dove. It has to do to that gentle creature that represents the Spirit of God and it represents peace. It represents humbleness. And in verses 1 to 3, we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. Let everyone please his neighbour for his good to edification, for even Christ pleased not himself. And then he quotes the balance of Psalm 69 verse 9, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. He knew exactly what he was doing in that temple court. And he didn't release the doves. He said, you take them hence. There is a lesson in that dove. And that lesson is that Christ pleased not himself. He always cared for the welfare of the others. And those who would purchase a dove for their offering were the poorest of the land. God made that provision that they could bring a dove 
as an offering instead of a sheep or an oxen or whatever the more expensive animal might have been because God cared for the orphan. He cared for the fatherless. He cared for the needy. He cared for the widow. And even in what he was doing in that temple place, our Lord spared those and he showed that lesson of Romans 15 here. The reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. How do we treat our father's house? Do we have that same care? Do we have that same consideration for our brethren and sisters? As John 2 says, take these things hence. He knew exactly what he was doing. And we come back to John chapter 2 and consider the lessons that are in that chapter there. Would they listen? Would they consider what the Lord was doing? Well, in the end, that was going to be up to them. This was the first time that he cleansed the temple. At the end of his ministry, matter of days before his crucifixion, he did that again. John doesn't worry about that second occasion. That's only in the other three Gospels. But there were two visitations. There were two visitations upon that house. And I think that's very significant, brethren and sisters. If we come to Hosea chapter 9, you will see many echoes of that 15th and 16th verse. And we, uh, we won't turn that up. We'll look at it here on the slide. But if you notice in chapter 9 and chapter 10 of Hosea, just as the Lord had done on that occasion, Hosea said in verse 15, I will drive them out of my house. Now, we're not going to go through Hosea. He was a prophet primarily to the northern nation, primarily just before the Assyrians came down and, and swept them all away. And he was coming to them to appeal to them before that great judgment descended upon them by the Assyrian kings. And he says, look, I will drive them out of my house. But Jesus was doing that. They had three years to get hold of that message. But if they didn't get hold of that message, then the Romans would come some 40 years later and would literally drive them out of that place. When Jesus came to the end of his ministry, verse 10 of Hosea 9, I saw your fathers, he said, you remember, just as he was coming up again to a few days before his crucifixion, he saw a first ripe fig, well at least should have been upon the fig tree. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig at her first time. He came to that tree looking for fruit. In verse 16, Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They bear no fruit. Here he was beginning that process. Look, I'm going to clean this temple and you should take the lesson from that because the time is going to come when if you don't heed what I'm doing here, God will drive you from your house. So he smote that fig tree because it bore no fruit. And in chapter 10 and verse 8, God says, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. And when that's happening, they shall say to the mountains, cover us, to the hills, fall on us. Now that's an echo, isn't it? Because when Jesus was taking his cross, despite the agony of that occasion, which we just can't barely, or scarcely imagine, he turns to those women and he says, the time is coming when they shall say, to the mountains, cover us, to the hills, fall on us. You see, they were the lessons of that first cleansing of that temple. Would they respond? Would they heed the words that Jesus was giving them in Hosea? Well, they were like a leprous house, the house of Israel. When you come again, we won't go there, but... If you're in your leisure, look at Le Leviticus 14. There were two inspections of a leprous house. The earlier part of chapter 14 is about leprosy of the body, the latter part leprosy of a, uh, a dwelling. They would inspect the, 
the house. The priest would shut it up for seven days, come and have another inspection. And on that first occasion, if the decay was still there, they removed those decayed sections and they replastered it. They had the opportunity for that house to recover. They had the opportunity from that first visit of the temple by our Lord. If the second occurrence, it's still there. If the decay returns, if it continues, there was only one a thing to be done. You'll break down the house, the stones of it, the timber thereof, the mortar of the house, carry them forth out of the city to an unclean place. But that's exactly what God did 40 years later. He carried them out of that place, out of that city, into the unclean place of the nations of the world for 2,000 years. You see, Jesus was very deliberate. Right there at the start of his ministry, he cleans that temple out. He gives them that, as it were, first warning. Change what is happening here. But they would not change. You come to Luke chapter 19. We'll turn this passage up. Here he is in the latter end of his ministry. Crucifixion not far away. Luke chapter 19. He comes to the city for the last time. And verse 41. When he was come near. Luke 19 and verse 41. When he was come near he beheld the city. And he wept over it. And had their day of opportunity. He knew what was going to happen in a few days hence. So he says to them. Or he says the record here in verse 44, 43. The days shall come, your enemies shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round about and keep thee on every side. Like it says in Deuteronomy 28. You shall lay thee even with the ground, thy children within thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. And this is my, as it were, second and final visitation because they knew us not the time of thy visitation. And what does he do in verse 45? He goes into that same temple and he casts out them that sold their em and them that bought saying, my house is the house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. And so they had not listened to the visitation of the Lord. They had the first occasion here in John 2 and now the final occasion and not one stone will be left upon another upon that house. It's going to change in the kingdom isn't it? Zechariah 14 says in verse 16 and 21 it shall come to pass every one that is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem which is going to happen in the very near future. They're going to go up to worship the king, Yahweh of armies. And in that day, in verse 21, Zechariah says, there shall be no more the trader, the merchandiser, the Canaanite in the house of Yahweh of armies. He'll be finally driven from that place to be no more, just like he was by the physical destruction of AD 70. But coming back to John chapter 2, that is why Jesus in a very controlled manner did what he did in these verses here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. They'd done exactly that. Overturned Yahweh's Passover, it was now the Jews' Passover. Breaching all the spirit of the law Deuteronomy 14 and all those other passages. What was their response, brethren and sisters? It says in verse uh, 14, and again, this is interesting by John. I mean, if it had happened to that, you'd be really angry. But what do they say? What sign, what miracle shows thee, seeing thou doest these things? See they, see, they knew, brethren and sisters, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew it was wrong. But they persisted in doing it. So all they do is try to challenge 
his authority. Show us a miracle that you're able to, to do the things that you've just done here in this place. You know, it seems a strange reply of the Lord. He says in verse 19, of course, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But he wasn't being difficult. He wasn't evading their question. He says, you destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. I will be raised from the dead. When you come to destroy me, they didn't altogether understand it at that point exactly what he was saying, but he's saying, you destroy me and I'll be raised up again in three days. When I am resurrected from the dead, you will know for a certainty about the things I have spoken here this day. Because they mocked that in verse 20. 46 years it's been building, in fact, even longer than that. You're going to do it in three days? And, you know, the word temple here is a different word gets used in verse 19 and verse 20 and verse 21. All the same word is used there, but it's a different word to the word temple in verse 14. <clears throat> Destroy this temple, said Jesus. I'll raise it up in three days. They twisted those words. Mark 14, when it came to his crucifixion, they got false witnesses to say, I will destroy this temple and in three days I'll build another. He didn't say that, brothers and sisters, did he? He said, destroy this temple. You destroy this temple, but I will raise it again in three days. They twisted it around saying, oh, he's going to destroy this temple out here with all these beautiful stones and he said he'd raise it again in three days and they twisted these things around to get an expersion of judgment against him. But they really did understand because Matthew 27, after he had been crucified, they come to Pilate and say, look, sir, we remember, we remember. This deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. So like all the things with the Lord's life, they knew exactly when he was born, who was his mother, the circumstances of his birth, the place where he lived and how he grew up. They understood what was happening at the year 12 when he came to the temple about his father's business. All of those things were carefully noted by those leaders. They came to him in the temptation, you know, you join with us and look what we can do. They were well aware of the power that was in this man. And here it is again, demonstrating, twist his words for their own ends, but we remember after three days, I will rise again. They were self-condemned, brethren and sisters. They knew exactly what the Lord meant. They both twisted his words as well as acknowledging the truth of them. And this word temple here is very, very interesting because there are two words used in the New Testament for temple. That's one of them. It's only ever that one used in the New Testament for the actual physical building, whether it be a pagan temple or whatever, but for the building itself. It's never ever used figuratively. You can look at every one of the examples. And that's the word in verse 14 and 15. It's talking about the physical temple. But there's a, slight, a change in the use of that word temple in verses 19 and 20 and 21. The Jews actually grabbed that word as well in, in John's record here. And that's used for both a physical building but also figuratively. And I think that's what this word is changed for in those verses there. It's use of the Lord's body here in verse 19 and again in, in verse 21. It's use of a believer's body in 1 Corinthians 6.19. It's used exclusively. It's the only word in the Greek used in Revelation for temple, that second one. Because in Revelation, of course, it is a symbol of the body of Christ and the spiritual temple that we all strive to be. Thus says God in Isaiah 57, I dwell, says God, with him that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. That's a temple 
that God desires to dwell in. Not bricks and mortar, but the spirit of our heart, the spirit of our mind that is a spirit of contriteness and humbleness that will follow his ways. And naos is not always used in that way, but it's the only word that is used that way in, in case of those two. Naos on other occasions is used of the building itself clearly, but it does have that other complexion. And that's why John changes it there, or the Spirit changes it there in verses 18, or 19 to 21. But the Jews used it too. Now were they speaking about a spiritual temple or a building? They were clearly talking about the building. They weren't interested in a contrite and a humble spirit. Which temple was going to survive? Destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. This one, this beautiful building, has been 46 years in building. You're going to destroy it and build it again in three days? Well, which temple survived, brethren and sisters? We know the answer to that. And in verse 22, so did the disciples when it happened. When he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now that's a, interesting really because verse 22 is a commentary by John. You will find that in the Gospel of John as we go through the studies, uh, as we go through the various chapters. John will add in a comment here and there now and again. He's not so much just talking about what happened, but he adds his comments. And verse 22 is one of those comments that it was only when Jesus was raised from the dead that they fully understood what that was all about. And as Brother Jamin again said, and I believe it's right, John was written around about AD 65. It was only a little time before that second event was going to happen, the destruction of the literal temple. And they would really then understand entirely what the Lord was talking about in this place here. Look after and prepare and get together the temple of God for his dwelling place or it'll end up as it did in AD 70. Brothers and sisters, Psalm 16 became a very commonly used quotation after the resurrection of Christ. When he was risen, in verse 22, when he was risen from the dead, they believed the scripture. And one of the key passages in the Old Testament that told them all about that was Psalm 16 verses 10 and 11. You will not leave my soul in the grave. You will not suffer this temple to see corruption. I will raise it up again at the third day because father and son worked together and they were going to fulfill that scripture and he would be shown the path of life in his presence, his fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. When he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Jesus was even here, right at the beginning of his ministry, preparing those disciples for that time to come. You know, as Brother Sam reminded us on Sunday morning, let's focus on the unseen. Things may not be happening as we might want them to or expect them to even in the world around us today, but God has a sure purpose. He's laid it out from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We're at the end of those 6,000 years and he will surely soon send his son and when he comes, it will be exactly, exactly at the right time. Just as the Lord deliberately did this and deliberately did it again the second time, just before his crucifixion, so God will send his son at exactly the right time. And afterwards, we will look back and say, wow, that was exactly the right time. It may not seem that way now, as Brother Sam said, let us concentrate on the unseen. 
for the unseen is eternal. You are the temple of God, every one of us is the dwelling place of the God of heaven, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. We come to the end of 2022. What is the Lord going to find when he examines our temple? Let's embrace the spirit of Isaiah, the spirit of our Lord, who pleased not himself, but always pleased his heavenly Father. And in Revelation, may we become eventually a pillar in the naos, in the temple of God. And may it be that this decade we see our return of our Lord to the earth. Thank you.